بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيد المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم I pray everybody is doing well this morning I am honored to have the topic of addressing uh, yearning for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as I was um, thinking um, about this topic I remembered a story that one of my ansat, one of my teachers, may Allah Ta'ala preserve her, taught us about the Sahabi who had a special status, Awais al Qarani. And I will give you more details about the life of Awais al Qarani in just a moment, but just kind of in one line, why the Prophet would give somebody who'd really never met him the status of a companion, because that's what's special about Awais al Qarani. He was conferred, the Prophet conferred upon him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the status of a Sahabi, of a companion, even though they'd not met because of Awais Al Qarani's um, devotion to his parents. So I was thinking about that as my parents, Brother Mansoor and Sister Kafi helped me get the kids ready so I could be here this morning. So now the definition of a companion, right? is literally that person who met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was an encounter, an interaction, a meeting between this person and the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, you know, during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that they believed in the Prophet and that they, they remained Muslim and that they died on Iman, they died with faith. So proximity is very, very important direct contact, meeting, interaction, encounter. And that's why Uwais al-Qarani is significant because he was one of those people that um, desired to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but was not able to do so. Now, the reason that Uwais al-Qarani was not able to do so was because he was devoted to caring for his mother. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam relates in a hadith, and this is a hadith, Qudsi, that Allah, exalted and mighty as He, loves of His creation, the God-fearing, the pure in the heart, those who are hidden and those who are innocent, whose face is dusty, whose hair is unkempt, whose stomach is empty, and who, if He asks permission to enter into the presence of the rulers, would be denied. And if He, he were to ask for even a gentle woman's hand in marriage, He would be refused. And when he leaves the world, it does not miss him. And if he goes out, his going is not even noticed. And if he falls sick, he is not attended to. And if he dies, he is not accompanied to his grave. And then the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, how can we find someone like that? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Awais al-Qarani is such a person. And they asked, who is Awais al-Qarani? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he is dark-skinned, of wide shoulder and of average height. His complexion is close to the color of earth. He has a long beard. His eyes are always looking downwards to the place of prostration and his right hand is on his left hand. He weeps with such a flow of tears that his lips are swollen. He wears a rough woolen garment and is known to the people of the heavens. If he makes a promise in the name of God, he keeps it. Under his left shoulder, there is a white spot when the day of resurrection comes and it is announced to the slaves, enter the garden, it will be said to Awais, stop and intercede. Allah Azza wa Jal will then forgive, will then forgive those people to the same number as are the people of Rabi'ah and Mudar. And these were two tribes that Awais al Qarani belonged to. And then the Prophet says specifically to Umar and Ali radiallahu anhuma, if you can find this person, ask him to intercede on your behalf, then Allah Ta'ala will forgive you. So as I was reading this story, it really struck me that number one, the Prophet is describing somebody whom he'd never met. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes somebody who is someone that would really sort of be kind of passed over or passed by. Like he wouldn't really stand out in a crowd, right? This is a very humble person. His hair is unkempt, his face is dusty. Um, he's not somebody who is kind of, um, viewed as someone from whom we could 
perhaps receive some type of recognition or social standing. I mean, he's not somebody who's a person of influence in the way that we construe influence. And I was thinking about this, this idea of yearning to meet the Prophet wasallam, and how in our current culture, when we admire somebody, right, especially speaking about celebrities and that type of thing, um, because this is a culture that really is kind of built on um, the idea of adulation of people for reasons that are not necessarily always the best reasons. But nonetheless, in our culture, just to make an analogy, right? So if we admire somebody, we typically look them up on social media, and we might like their page and become their quote-unquote followers and, uh, and read, you know, sort of follow their career and whatever, and their exploits in the news, et cetera, et cetera. We might want to read books about them if it's somebody who, say, has passed away, collect memorabilia, et cetera. And, but the thing, I mean, why are we drawn towards emulating this person to begin with? Like, what is it about them that we yearn to sort of connect with, right? And in many cases, it's because this is a person of some type of high social status or standing or political clout. Um, they have educational attainments, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, what should draw us, right, to this person is because they have qualities that are worth emulating. That's what draws us to this person. And that's why we yearn to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's why we want to be like the Owais al Qaranis of the world, right? This was a very humble person. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the best of creation, is praising a person that we would just walk right on by. If Owais al Qarani lived today, would we invite him to speak? Would we create a Facebook page for him? Would we follow him on Twitter? Probably not. But the Prophet wasallam said that this, he directed, of all people, Amar and Ali radiallahu anhuma, right? These are two of the rightly guided caliphs, some of the best human beings ever created, right? After prophets and messengers, Allah ta'ala directs, directs Amar and Ali to actually look up Awais al-Qarani. So about a decade goes by after this conversation. And... Um, uh, Ali and Amar are trying to find Owais al Qarani. So, in the year 644 CE, about 20 or 21 years after Hijra, Amar, and of course, this is after the passing of the Prophet, وسلم, goes to the mountains of Abu Qubais. These are mountains encircling Mecca, and calls out, O people of the Yemen, is there anyone who knows Owais? So, an elderly man stands up and says, We do not know who this Owais is about whom you ask, but I have. A nephew, my brother's son, is called Owais, but don't bother with him. He's just simply too unimportant to even be asked about, is what he says. He's poor, and he's kind of submissive and docile, and, and we don't think that he is somebody worthy of your consideration. He's a camel herder, is what the elderly man says, and he has no standing amongst our people. But Amar still persisted and asked if he knew how to find Owais. And the man answered, why do you ask about him, O commander of the faithful? For by Allah, there is not one of us who is more foolish and more needy than this Owais. And Amar weeps and says to him, you are so, but not he. For I heard the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa say, those who enter the garden through Owais, asking for forgiveness for them, are the people of the tribe of Rabi'a and Mudar in their number, right? That he has this ability to, to, he's been given, right? This permission to intercede on behalf of a number of people seeking to enter paradise. So Amar wants to know where is Owais? And he's told he's actually here on the Mount of Arafah. So Amar and Ali actually go to Arafah and they find Owais praying. And the camels that he's herding, they're grazing around him. And they greet him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So Owais returns their greeting after his prayer. And they say, who are you? He says, I'm a herdsman of camels, and I'm a simply I'm a hired workman for this tribe. And they said, we do not ask you about your tending of animals, nor about your being a hired worker, but what is your name? And he answered, Abdullah. And they said, all the people of the heavens and the earth are the slaves of Allah, but what is the name in which your mother named you? And then he says, what do you want from me? And then they say to him that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once told us about this man, Owais Al-Qarani, and he described you. And he said to look for a white mark under your left shoulder. So he showed them his left shoulder, and indeed they saw that white mark. And then they embraced him and kissed him and said, we declare that you are Owais Al-Qarani, so ask for forgiveness for us, and may Allah forgive you. Imagine people of the stature of Amar and Ali 
seeking out this man simply because the Prophet وسلم, said there would be those who would yearn to meet me and they would not have a chance to meet me but seek them out and ask for their ask them to intercede for Allah Ta'ala's forgiveness. So Uwais Al-Qarani, being the humble person he was, says, I cannot even forgive myself nor one of Adam's children. He says, but there are on land and in the seas other believing men and women, Muslim men and women whose invocations to God are answered. And they replied, surely this is so. Then he said, how, O oh, you two, you know about me and I know about my state, but who are you? And then at this point, Ali responds, this is Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab, and I am Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Awais at that point straightens up and says, Assalamu alaikum ya Amir al-Mu'mineen and you, O Ali, may Allah repay you with goodness for this community. And they said, may Allah repay you for yourself and your goodness. And it is this type of love and emulation that really motivated people to travel long distances to see and to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even if they could not meet with the Prophet, then what they would do is, right, they wanted to, after, especially after the Prophet's passing, they would seek out those who knew the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who'd spent time with the Prophet. And there is a hadith where our beloved messenger predicts this, right, where he says, I wish I could meet, and this is from Anas ibn Malik, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I wish I could meet my brothers, and the Prophet's companions said, are we not your brothers? And the Prophet said, you are my companions. And it says, the Arabic is an Anas ibn Malik, قال, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم, وددتو أني لقيتو إخواني, فقال أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, أو ليس نحن إخوانك, right? Are we not your brothers? He says, أنتم أصحابي ولكن إخواني الذين آمنوا بي ولم يروني. Again, you are my companions, but my brothers are those who have faith in me. Although they never saw me. And I think every time we consider the beauty of this religion, every time we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us Muslims, every time Allah Ta'ala blesses us with the desire to want to worship and to pray and to fast and to be kind to those around us. It's not because of some intrinsic merit of ours, but it's because maybe just in a really small way that we yearn to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to follow in his footsteps. There are um, some beautiful discussions. I want to conclude with just a reminder on, um, related by, in the Shifa of Qadi Ayyad. And there are, there are several ahadith, and one, one that really spoke to me, this is from Abu Huraira, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, those in my community with the strongest love for me are the people who will come after me. See, we, we praise the generation of the companions and the tabi'een and we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said they are the best of generations because they had that proximity to the Prophet but we're removed right from the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by 14 centuries right we're in the 15th century now actually but he said again those in my community with the strongest love for me are the people who will come after me some of them would give their family and wealth to have seen me. Also related in the Shifa, one night Amar عنه, went out to observe the people because he would do this to see how people were doing. And he saw a lamp burning in a house. An old woman was carting some wool. And while she was doing her work, she kept saying, the prayer of the good be upon Muhammad. May the blessed bless him. I was standing in tears before dawn. If only I knew when death gives us different forms, whether the abode will join me to my beloved. She meant the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that brought Amr Radiallahu Anhu to tears. When Bilal was near death, it was said his wife called out, O oh, sorrow. And Bilal said, what joy? 
I will meet those I love, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his party. May Allah Ta'ala allow us to meet our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the hold, at that pool where we drink from his blessed hand. And may we bring actions of which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be happy and proud, insha'Allah Ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.